morning, everybody, and welcome to our live stream service from Mount Lane Baptist Church on this Palm Sunday morning. Here to celebrate the start of Easter week. Let us bow for a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you now. Ask you to be with us during this service, Lord. Use it to reach out to our people. Give them comfort and peace, Lord, in this hard time around us, Lord. We ask you to be with them. Almighty God, we ask now you be with all the sick in the community and all around the world, Lord, and help heal them from this virus. Almighty God, we thank you for our health and our blessings every day. We ask in Jesus' almighty name. Amen. We welcome you again this morning to our service. and. Just a few words of announcement. Uh, we're still making CDs and DVDs this service. If you need a copy or want a copy, uh, contact Stevie Stanford and we'll get you a copy. Um, we'll either drop it off on your store step or when you talk to him, you explain to him how you want to receive it. And we'll get you a copy of it if you want a copy of it. Just a matter of fact. Um, we're going to start this morning by recognizing birthdays. It's the first Sunday in April, and first Sunday in the month we always recognize birthdays. So if you have a birthday in April, we can't ask you to stand up because nobody here to stand up. Uh, we do have one here, okay, Heather. It's got a birthday in April. Happy birthday. And then anniversaries in um, April, if you have an anniversary, pat yourself on the shoulder and Thank you for everything that you do. And we're going to sing Happy Birthday.
beautiful day to worship. And we're glad you have tuned in this morning and we pray God will bless you real good and that uh, know that Jesus loves you and we love him. I will read from Luke the 19th chapter and one of the most beautiful passages, I like this passage about the triumphal entry that Jesus made in Jerusalem. In verse 33, and as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord had need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now, at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice in all the mighty works that they had seen him do, saying, Blessed the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And so the Pharisees among the multitude said unto the Master, Rebuke your disciples. He answered and said, I tell you, if these should hold thy peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And over also in Luke, the 23rd chapter, in verse 13, Pilate, as he called the chief priests and rulers together, the people, he said unto them, You brought this man unto me as one that perverted the people. And behold, I have examined him before you, and I have found no fault in this man, touching those things whereof you have accused him. No, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him. And lo, nothing worthy of death was done unto him, even from Herod. I will therefore chastise him and release him. For the necessity, he must release one of them at the feast. And they cried out once more, Away with this man, and release unto us Barabbas, who for a certain sedition made in the city, for the murder was, was cast in jail, in prison. Pilate therefore, willing to release Jesus, spake again unto them. But they cried, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And he said unto them the third time, Why, what evil has this man done? I found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. And they were instant with their voices and required that he might be crucified. And the voices of the chief priests of that prevailed. And Pilate sentenced gave sentence that it should be as they required. He released unto them Jesus, that for sedition and murder was cast in prison, for whom they desired, but delivered Jesus to thy will. May we bow together in prayer. Lord, we do know that when they released Jesus, they crucified him on the cross. And yet on that cross, he looked out at them and said, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. Father, we know that even now Jesus is crucified every day, day after day, crucified by the sins of mankind. His life, his perfect life, his sinless life, his glory, Father, shines evermore. I thank you, Lord, we serve a Christ that's living. Not a dead Christ on the cross, not a dead Christ in the grave, but a resurrected Christ. And I pray, Jesus, you'd be so real to us this morning. Holy Spirit, anoint us afresh to preach and sing and pray. Anoint the service, anoint the heroes. And may each one know, Father, that one's prayer carries weight upon a service like this. Praying people gets God's attention. A praying church is a lively church. And no one's ever been saved or brought to the knowledge of salvation except they've been prayed for. And Father, we pray that in the midst of our difficulties in the, our United States of America, the things that's going on, we'll see a surge of your power like we've never seen before in our churches. Anoint our pastors as they preach this morning, wherever they preach. Anoint the services that we'll see a spiritual awakening 
to blanket this whole nation and our leaders and bless our president. Anoint him, Father, that you might give him wisdom to lead us and anoint each of us that we might have the wisdom to follow your direction for us. We praise you now. We thank you for what you're about to do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, I'm Heather Bowling and this is my son Landon and we are going to be singing to you, for you today one of our favorite Easter songs titled New Again. In this song it's a conversation between Mary, Jesus and God and the message we want you to hear this morning is that no matter what you're going through, God has sent his son to die on the cross and rose from the grave to make all things new again and the same power that rose Jesus from the grave is available to you if you will just ask.
Jesus said, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The fragrance of the cross. It's been said that the true test of one's rightness with God is his ability to forgive. Forgive those that have wrongly treated you. It is a test of one's devotion to Christ, and that's the spirit of forgiveness. It's the cure for every troubled marriage. It's the cure for every troubled home. It's the cure for every troubled church. It's the cure for friendship that's been disturbed. A soldier once said, or rather died in the arms of a chaplain, and the chaplain held him in his arms. The soldier's last words were, tell my brother I forgive him. Tell my brother I'm not mad at him. Tell him I forgive him and prepare to come to heaven. I want to meet him in heaven one day. And I thank the Lord that his brother listened to those words. Because a lot of folks today that do not listen to those words. Stephen Olford was a Scottish preacher and he lived in Africa. He was born there for many years. His, he watched his father and mother as they ministered in the jungles of Africa. He saw many wondrous signs done by the mighty hand of God. And one day, Olford, Stephen, young Stephen, was out preaching far away, and his father died. He couldn't get back. And so in return, he said that my father had the last words for me. And one said, yes, he did. He said, tell young Stephen to preach the word. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with long suffering. Do thou the work of the evangelist, because a time will come, young Stephen, when men will not endure sound doctrine, but will heap for themselves itching ears. They want to hear what you what, what they want to hear, and not what the word of God says. The heroic Dudley Team was a powerful preacher, and once preaching in this Colosseum, hundreds of people were there, and he gave the invitation. Five hundred people received Christ in that service. A few days after that, Dudley Team was in an accident. He had a terrible accident, a freak accident. As he was lying upon his bed in the bedroom, there were people gathering around, and he took hold of his venerable father, Dr. Stephen, and he said, Father, stand up for Jesus. Stand up for Jesus. And tell my brethren in the Lord to stand up, stand up for Jesus. One man scribbled those words down on a piece of paper as he was inspired by what this preacher said on his way out going to heaven. And he wrote down the song we sing so many times. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, you soldiers of the cross. Lift up his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. And indeed the words of our Lord were precious indeed, his last words as he, as he hung upon that cross. And the scripture says he was praying. You know, many invalids throughout our world today who can't get up and walk and, and they can't do anything physically for Jesus. But you know what they're doing? They're doing like Jesus was doing. They're praying on that bed. And one such invalid was praying for revival to take place in her, her town. She prayed for a specific preacher to come there, an evangelist. And God answered her prayer. The evangelist came to the town and not only that, he came to her church and went out and visited her one day and she said, Brother, I want you to know that you've been in my prayers every day and I've been praying that God would bring you here and he has. 
And oh, what a revival that took place too. That lady is praying. And so it was with Jesus on the cross. Now I want you to notice, first of all, the prayer of the cross. The prayer of forgiving love radiating from the cross. Oh, that's the fragrance of the cross. If you notice, when Jesus was on that cross, he, there was a prayer of submissiveness. A few hours previously in the garden, he had knelt in the garden and he prayed as it were, sweat was falling from his face as great drops of blood. That's the intensity and agony of his praying. He said, Father, I don't want to go through with this. If it be thy will, remove this cup from me. But Father, if you want me to take that, if that's what you want me to do, he said, I will do it. You see, Christ even on that cross could have destroyed his enemies. He could have seen judgment upon the world, but he didn't do it. In the garden of Gethsemane, when the priest and the soldiers came to apprehend Jesus, uh, Peter pulled out his sword and clipped off the ear of the servant of the high priest, Malchus, it was his name. And I want you to see that sight. When that ear fell from Malchus's head, Jesus reached down and picked the ear and put it back on his head. And all of them stood there and they saw that, but they didn't believe. I, I guess to say that Malchus was a changed man after that, he could not get over that. And I believe that God, Jesus hadn't said something to Peter, Peter would have done more damage with that sword. But Jesus said, Peter, put away this sword. This is not a physical fight. This is not a spiritual, a physical battle. It's a spiritual warfare. And that's what Jesus was up against in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was agonizing the flesh, his last battle with the flesh, in his submission to the cross. He said to Peter, do you not know I can appeal to my father? He would send me 72,000 angels. Oh man, can you see that sight? I believe that heaven already the angels had their swords drawn just waiting for Jesus to say the word. But you know, it wasn't the nails that kept Jesus on the cross. It was the love of God. It was the submissive of Jesus to the Father's heavenly will. And that's why we come here today and preach the gospel. I want you to notice the scope of his praying. Look what he says there. Forgive them, Father. And there are those who argue that the word them refers specifically to the Roman soldiers. Well, I believe that little word them is all inclusive. It included Judas who betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. Can you imagine 30 pieces of silver? He sold his soul. He sold his eternal life for this life. Jesus said, what shall man profit to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall you give in exchange for your soul? How shall you escape if you neglect your own soul? It also included Pilate, who washed his hands and he, he said, I, I'm innocent of the blood of this man, you take it. Oh, but all the water in the world will not wash the blood of Jesus off his hands. Pilate was guilty, and we're all guilty. We all have the blood of Jesus Christ on our hands, but I know one thing that can cleanse our hands. There's only one thing that can have cleansed the hands of Pilate, and that's the shed blood of Christ. The Bible says the blood of Jesus cleanses of all sin. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness. Those that mock the cross and they make fun of the blood of Jesus, my dear friend, that's the payment of the debt of your sin. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then my Asbestos, when he had the apostle preach, he said, Thou art mad, Paul. Thy much learning has made thee mad. And I've often wondered about Festus, who's been separated now in the eternity of the ages, the many opportunities that Festus had to receive Christ, and he didn't do it. I wonder who's mad now as they were separated from God, and not to mention Felix, who was under the sound of the gospel, and Paul had preached temperance, righteousness, and the judgment to come. And Felix trembled under the sound of the gospel. I don't believe Felix could have been any closer to the kingdom of God than he was right then that day. As he was under the sound of sin, righteousness, and judgment, he could see a presence and he felt a supernatural moving in his life like he'd never felt before. But he put it off. And never again do we read where Felix ever had that opportunity to, to repent and be saved. And this might be a moment in your life when God is stirring in your heart and your being like you've never felt it before. He's speaking to your mind. 
This might be your opportunity to take Christ into your life. And I believe God speaks all the time, especially through the scriptures. And then there's the priest whose voices was the loudest at the cross. The scripture says when Jesus made his triumphal entry in Jerusalem, they were laying them palm leaves or branches off the trees and they were putting their coats down before Jesus. And they said, Hosanna, the King of David. Hosanna to the highest. I believe right then they would have known it, Jesus as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And uh, the Pharisees didn't like that. And they tried to get him to sh shut him up. And Jesus said if, if they did, even the very stones would cry out. Did you know that scientists even right now, every word I've said this morning, they can extract sounds from this solid piece, this pulpit, and play them back to us. If man can do that, what can God do? The Bible says every idle word man speaks and give an account thereof on the day of judgment. They cried out, crucify him, away with it, let him have it. I believe that this prayer included every child, every man, every woman, since before the cross and after the cross. I heard about a young lady who gave herself to the art of soul winning. She always wanted to win somebody to Christ. And so she took a lesson on soul winning, how to witness to people. And nervously she went out after they trained and she talked to a young man she'd never seen before. She didn't know him. And nervously her lips were quivering as she was telling about the cross and how Jesus took our sins on the cross, how he was broken on the cross, how he became the perfect sacrifice for our sins. And as she was doing that, he, he said, could, could you stop for a moment? Could, could, you, could you repeat that? Could, could you go over that again? She said, what part? She, he said, that part about the cross. And so she explained the cross again to this young man. And when she did, he broke down and started crying. And he found a saving faith in Jesus Christ. That was another young lady who in England was sharing her faith. And the one she was sharing it with didn't have much interest in it. It's amazing how that is. You can tell the gospel and hear one on this side will accept it, all ready for it. And the one on the left side don't, don't want to have anything to do with it. And she was talking to this boy. He had no clue what she was saying. I don't think he was even listening. But after she got through, he said, I don't think I'm ready for that. But it was, a, it was another little girl standing over about three feet from her. said, well, well I'm ready for it. I was listening to that. Could you tell me how to be saved? And so that young lady accepted Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior. You see, the scope of his praying took in the whole world. Christ died for all men. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe on him would not perish but have eternal life. And then the second thing I see here, that is the power of the cross. The power of forgiving love. Charles Spurgeon went to visit a farmer, and the farmer had, had up a new weather vane, and it read, God is love. And Spurgeon said to the farmer, he said, does that mean that God's love is like the wind? It comes and goes? He said, no, Mr. Spurgeon, God's love is whichever way the wind blows. Uh, I believe that's the way it ought to set with us this morning. God's love is whichever way the wind blows. And I pray his wind will blow you away this morning. And his power, his mighty spirit is reaching out all the time, convicting of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He's all the time tugging at our hearts. You see, his love was a magnetic love. There he is. He'd been hurled at by the wind of abuse. The thieves, they cast the same into his teeth. One said, yeah, in Christ, why don't you save yourself and save us? And they both hurled their judgment upon Jesus. They crucified him. They, they lacerated his body with whips and they spit on him. And Jesus hanging out his flesh quivering upon the cross. And even though they railed with their accusations at him, Jesus did something that got their attention. He didn't fight them. He didn't curse them. He said, Father, forgive them. Forgive them, Father. That's, a, that's the fragrance of the cross, the radiating love from the cross. I believe Jesus is teaching us as a, a lesson here as Christians. 
Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Because great is your reward in heaven. Jesus not only taught us how to treat those that wrong us, he's also teaching us here in his prayer, do not regard anyone beyond the reach of praying. If you pray, if you're sincere about praying for that father, that son, that daughter, or that sinner, or that, that one to get well, whatever you pray for, fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man avails much. Dr. David Smith in the life of Christ speaks of the kind of thing that often happens to criminals when they're crucified. He said they shirk, they yell, they curse, they spat at our torturers, but here's one that forgave. Love can reach out quicker than anything else. That's what drew them. The Roman soldiers, as they had crucified him, I'm sure they were spellbound when they heard him say, Forgive them, Father. A man that went through all of this, and, and these are the words that fell from his lips, the thief on the cross, who had been hurling the same at Jesus, he heard those words, and I know that his, his mind, his attitude changed. He looked over at Jesus and he saw, this is no ordinary man. He saw a Christ beyond the cross. He saw a kingdom beyond the grave. And he saw a Christ as the coming king. He said, Lord, remember me when thy comest in thy kingdom. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. That day he went to paradise with Jesus. The other man rejected Christ and was separated from Jesus and from God in eternity, throughout eternity separate from God. But this thief went right on to heaven. You know, that's, a, that's amazing as we think about that, with how much God loves us. And then that's a centurion servant, hard as nails, calloused. He said to the soldiers, do your job and do what you do quickly. And the soldiers took Jesus, they took his hands and those hands that had healed the sick, the hands that had embraced the little children, the hands that had broken the loaves and fed the multitude, the hands that had done wonders and signs, and they, they drove a spike in his hand. They drove nails in the hand of, hands of Jesus. Can you believe driving a nail in the hand of God? That's what they were doing. And they, they jarred the cross in the ground, and he hung there on the cross. And Jesus looks at them and so they can feel the presence of something supernatural there. He said, forgive them, Father. And that centurion servant was spellbound. And later we read that he said, truly this was the Son of God. And not only was the power of forgiving love, the power of the cross, a magnetic love, it was a matchless love. They know not what they do, Jesus said, forgive them. Did they really not know what they were doing? Did the soldiers not know what they were doing? They were familiar with the happenings around Jerusalem. They had heard him preach. Many times they had gone to apprehend Jesus, but they were so taken with his words and they were mesmerized as they, as they walked into the presence of Jesus to take him. And one time the scripture said they fell backwards. And God's word was getting through to them. And sure, the priest must have known of course, Jesus laid them out one day. He said, you whitewash soldiers. You make the outside white and clean, but on the inside you're dead. You're like dead men's bones. He said, you hypocrites. Well, they didn't forget that. And they were full of animosity and, and all the powers of hell worked in them to try to drive Jesus to the cross and and they influenced the crowd, crowd crucify him. Let Barabbas go, but kill this man Jesus. There's a whole lot of folks doing that today. They're letting Barabbas go, and they're killing Jesus. And surely, Pilate knew who he was after weighing all the facts. He had already he looked at the crowd and said, "Look, I don't find anything wrong with this man. What, what has he done? What evil has he done?" I know he healed the blind, he calls the deaf to hear, he cleans the lepers. I'm sure he remembered the time when Jesus cast out devils. What evil has he done? He's not finding no fault in him. And his wife came in with a message and said, 
have nothing to do with this righteous man. I've suffered many things in a dream because of him. Yet in spite of it all, our Savior could pray, forgive them. That was trouble in this church in Scotland. Oh, they had some contention going on that. And the, something very decisive had come up in the fellowship. And one of the men stood up and said, look, I, I, I demand my rights. And another stood up and said, your rights? My dear brother, Jesus didn't die for our rights. He died for our wrongs. He said, we're all wrong. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all need to repent of and get on our knees before God and let God bring revival. Oh, did God get a hold of the words of that man and God shot revival through that church in Scotland. I believe that's where revival is going to happen in our churches, in our homes, and in our marriages when we get right with God and when we take God seriously at His Word and we believe that prayer works and we believe that God's still in the working miracle working business and believe that the Christ of the cross is, is the Christ is living and indwelling in the life of every born again believer. You are carrying around a treasure in your heart. Know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit that dwelleth in you? He's in you. He's your hope of glory. You know, we're just passing through this life, Christian. we got something great in store for us. Uh, I mean, as bad as things might seem right now around us, uh, and I know people are living in fear, but I have no fear of what's going on because I know my, hand, my life is in the hand of Jesus. And I'm, I'm cautious, but we need to walk in the Spirit and we need to pray in the Spirit and take advantage of the situation because God is doing something good in spite of it all. Whatever troubles you're going through right now, whatever problems and perplexities, my friend, God loves you. And that same forgiveness on the cross is radiating from the cross now. It takes in you. It takes in this preacher. He said, I forgive you. I love you. He says, come unto me. All of you that burden heaven late, and I'll give you rest. That's what he was saying on the cross. Just come to me. I'll give you life. Jesus says, I am the resurrection. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Have you believed on this Christ? Will you spend eternity with God one day because you know that He's real in your heart this morning? Yes, it's a matchless love. And then thirdly, the pattern of the cross, the pattern of forgiving love. This is the pattern of forgiving love. It is, it is the same pattern for every age and for every Christian. But what kind of pattern is that? Jesus took up His cross. You see, that's a cross we must bear. That's the pattern, the cross. When Jesus prayed those words, he was in excruciating pain. His body was broken. He was bleeding. He, he was bruised. Instruments of torture had taken its toll on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As he took up his cross, how can we look at the cross of Christ and not forgive? How can we look at the cross of Christ and not take up the cross and follow him? Jesus said, if any man would follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Someone said, we do not really know how to forgive until we can forgive from a heart that is pained and crushed. And this is what Paul called the fellowship of his sufferings. <clears throat> I remember some years ago, a lady, 91 years old, wanted to talk to me. And I went in to see her. She said, Preacher, I've had something that's been troubling me for years. And I just wanted somebody to talk to. I said, well, okay, what is it? She said, a long time ago, a young man and I went up into the attic of my house. And I'm not going to tell you what we did. I think you can read between the lines. And she said, it's been troubling my conscience ever since. And I said, my dear lady, I'm sorry you've had to carry that all these years because that's what the cross is all about. Jesus Christ took our sins and our judgment upon that cross. That means every sin. He took that sin you committed on the cross and he'll forgive you. 
you can get forgiveness and be cleansed inside even right now. And your slate can be clean, your heart can be clean, that when you leave this life, you'll stand before him as a saved individual and with a clean heart. Because you know what he's going to look at? He's not going to look at your dirty heart. He's going to look at the blood that's been sprinkled out by faith, the cleansed heart through the blood of Jesus. Oh, she got released that day as she prayed and invited the Lord in her heart. I hope you'll do the same this morning if, the, if you haven't found Christ yet as your Savior. Cora Tim Boone was in Germany. She hid a lot of the Jews that had been killed and murdered and had been put to concentration camps and in gas chambers. And she was caught, and her and her sister were caught doing that, and they were put in the concentration camp. And her sister uh, was being abused over and over again, and Corey being a Christian, she said, I couldn't help it, I just could not forgive that guard. She said, I want to kill him. And she said, I pray hard because the hatred mustered up in my heart, and I'd see how my sister was treated because she was a, a, a good looking lady. And she is being abused over and over again. And I have to be honest, I want to kill him. And years later, uh, Tori was released. Her sister died in prison. And Croy was given a lecture one time, preaching and, or speaking and telling people about Christ and the cross and forgiveness. And she, the invitation was given. And uh, well, actually, she, after the service was over with, this, this German walked up to her. And the closer he got, she began to realize who he was. And at that moment, all the, the anger and all the animosity and all the hatred that she'd had for him while she was in prison and that concentration camp began to come up to the surface. And she knew then God had put her on the spot. And when he walked up to her, he reached out his hand for forgiveness. And Corey, at that moment, but an act of will reached her hand out and took him. And when she said when she did, she felt a release of all that anger and that animosity that she was, through God's grace, able to forgive this man that had so treated her sister. And hallelujah, God came on the scene. He was saved. I want to close with this personal illustration. When I was a little boy, we used to love to go play go-karting. We, we built our own go-karts and we'd ride down the woods and have a great time. Well, my cousin and I one day were riding my cart and I had a bad wheel. And my neighbor had four good wheels. And so he looked over at that bad wheel on mine and said, so look, he's got four good wheels. Let's just take one of his and we put it on your cart. Well, he was a little bit older than I was, but that's no excuse for seeing that. I said, okay, let's, let's do it. And so he took that wheel off that boy's cart and put it on mine, so we just had a good time. And that night I went to bed, and the next day my neighbor approached me, and he said, you know what? Somebody stole my cart, my, my wheel off my go-kart last night. And I thought this was my, I thought this was one of my good friends. He didn't scold me. He didn't say you did it. He said, "This fellow who I thought was my best friend had stole my wheel. He might as well have poured hot coals on my head, because it was a spear in my heart, a sword in my heart. And that night, when everybody went to bed." I took that wheel off my go-kart and went out there and put it back on his. You know what? The next day, we were together playing again. He had a few years on me, but we had a good time playing together. His forgiveness brought reconciliation. He never mentioned it again. And you know what? I had his funeral about a month ago. The young man that had been missing all this time, nobody could find him. I had his funeral. He's in heaven right now. One day, we'll be together again. 
Are you planning to go to heaven? Have you given your life over to Christ? Do you know that you're a sinner? I'm a sinner. I'm a saved sinner now by grace. I'm not going to heaven because I preach or because I go to church every Sunday. I'm going to heaven because that was a time in my life when I repented of my sins and I took Christ as my Savior. He came to save you. And right now, you can find your peace with God. And you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt, if you die tonight, you'll go to heaven. You'll be with Him. Would you pray with me? And just pray this prayer. Dear God, I know that you love me. You forgave me on the cross. I ask that you forgive me, Lord, of my sins. I repent of my sins. I turn from my sins. And I, by faith, Jesus, I receive you into my heart, in my life. And I give my heart over to you. I turn my life over to you, Jesus. Take what's left of my life and let me live it for you. Be the Lord of what's left of my life, Jesus. Save me. Would you pray that prayer? Almighty God, we pray that you will so bless throughout the world today the many preachers and many messages that go out in songs and, and such singing we've heard this morning and such beautiful playing on the piano and the music. And the sweet music that you give forth, Lord, from your word. Through your own lips, Jesus, I forgive them. I forgive you. I want to save you. We thank you. We praise you for what you're doing, Lord. In Christ's name, amen. May God bless you real good.